Okay, I think we are indeed live now. Um, great. Um, thank you everyone for joining us for this press briefing today. My name is Bahan Taye. I am um, a senior policy analyst and the global internet shutdowns lead at Access Now, and I will be moderating this um, session. Uh, so before we start, uh, we'll take uh, from 30 to 60 minutes for this press briefing today. Um, the audience is highly encouraged to ask questions by indicating that in the chat. Uh, my colleague Alexia uh, and Felicia will be collecting them and will be answering all your questions uh, here. Um, so with me today are five individuals that are most likely my favorite ones because they're the ones that go and sue the governments when they shut down the internet. And unlike other ones, these guys win. Uh, and I, I must tell you, it feels really nice to win. Uh, so we'll, we'll, before we dive into, <clears throat> into the issues of internet shutdowns and how these guys were convinced to go uh, you know, sue their, their respective governments, um, uh, I, you know, we'll do a first very brief uh, introduction and we'll, we'll go al alphabetically. So if we can start with Ade, if you can unmute yourself, um, tell us who you are, which organization and, and the city that you're calling in from today, that'd be great. Yeah, uh, thank you uh, very much. <laughs> Uh, I'm Ade. Uh, I'm working for the Legal Aid Center for uh, the Press. Uh, we are in Indonesia. The focus in the freedom of uh, expression and freedom of press. Uh, in the case of the internet shutdown, uh, it is the first case in Indonesia, and uh, we won the case. And it's very Perfect. Uh, uh, good precedent for the internet freedom in Indonesia. Awesome, yes, and we'll definitely dive more into that. Um, Amy, you're next. Are you with us, Amy? If you're talking, you're muted. Yeah. Ah, Thank okay. you very much. Thank you very much. I hope it is not an internet shutdown again in the country. Yeah. Thank you. I am Eme Adi. I am the director of uh, Amnesty National in Togo, uh, the section of the whole movement you know very well on human rights issues. In Togo, we are around 2,000 members and we are focused on uh, human rights monitoring and uh, other issues concerning the country. Great. Um, thank you so much. Uh, Natalia, I think it's you next. Yes, hello everyone. My name is Natalia Krapiva. I'm a tech legal ag uh, counsel at Access Now. Peter? Hi, I'm Peter Mysek. I'm general counsel at Access Now and lead our UN policy work. Thank you, Peter. Saba? Hi, everyone. I'm Saba. I'm a senior legal officer at Media Defense. Um, we're based in London. Great. Um, thank you so much. And as you can see, this press conference is not going to be disappointing at all. We have stellar folks here, so I'm hoping you'll stay with us until um, the end of our session. Um, so before we get into the questions, I want to set the scene a bit. Um, so so far in 2020, we, we as Access Now and the Keep Long Coalition have documented more than 53 internet shutdown incidents in at least 15 countries. Um, you might say, you know, this is not a bad number compared to what we had last year around this time, uh, but that's not the case. You know, we're hoping, especially because now we are uh, living under, a, you know, a, a pandemic around the world. We thought that you know, governments would halt uh, their practice of denying millions of citizens the right to practice numerous fundamental freedoms enabled by the internet, but unfortunately that's not the case. In 2019, um, Access Now and again, the Keep On Coalition documented at least 213 internet shutdowns around the world and specifically in 33 countries. In 2018, uh, again, we documented over 196 shutdowns in 25 countries. So what that really tells you is that um, internet shutdowns are becoming a recurrent issue and it doesn't seem like they're going away anytime soon. As I'm speaking to you today, for instance, uh, we've learned that the government in Zimbabwe is threatening to shut down the internet during an impending, uh, impending protest that is most likely going to happen tomorrow. Um, this is not the first time Zimbabwe has shut down the internet, and if they do go ahead tomorrow, um, that's going to be a disaster because there's 
um, government has already arrested a few journalists and activists and the situation um, we're worried is going to be the same one as, um, as, the, uh, as Zimbabwe was in 2019, January. Uh, but, you know, um, all is not gloom and all is not bad. At least we have intervened and, and you know, these, these, these colleagues of mine on, on the call have intervened in at least two international shutdowns that have happened in 2019, one in 2019 uh, and another one in, in 2017 in Togo and in Indonesia, respectively, and they have won. Um, so at least, you know, that's good news that we have in 2021 one of the very few good news. Um, so with that being said, I want to I wanna ask my colleagues uh, a, a few questions. So and I'll, I'll come to you, um, Emi Adi from, uh, from Togo. Um, if you can, you know, briefly explain to us what are the circumstances that led to the internet being shut down in Togo in 2017? Um, and that's not the, the last and the first time Togo has shut down the internet. And why did you as Amnesty Togo, Amnesty International Togo take, uh, you know, the Togolese government to court and specifically why the ECOWAS court? Uh, so over to you, Emi. Okay. Again, again, thank you very much for the organizers for this invitation. Uh, I am happy also to join uh, this press conference. It's an honor uh, to share the experience and learn more with other colleagues. Uh, um, in Togo, in 2017, we have a huge public demonstration in the country. Several are very peaceful, but we have received uh, uh, real attacks from uh, governments. As you know, Togo is a very small country in West Africa where you have uh, a particular regime, a political context, which is uh, in relation with uh, the power and the authorities in the country. And I think uh, the internet shutdown arrived like as a surprise for many people. We know that we haven't a good debit of internet in the country, but it became like something very uh, strong from the authorities after using police uh, force and other tools to stop the demonstration in the country they take the internet shutdown as another method to stop how people can join themselves and uh, claim something people are asking when the demonstration uh, constitutional review because we have a regime where you can you can go, you can run as you want when you want to become as a president and people want the change. And they started a uh, uh, demonstration with political parties, particular opposition parties. But after civil society also joined the demonstration and uh, we see a big trend of uh, a contestation of authorities in the country. And we have received this shutdown after several days the problem was how to make the proof that it is a, a, a internet shutdown because it is start very slowly and after you have any nothing uh, when when you run through the country it is to all the country it's not something in the capital or in the big areas but it is in the all, all, all the country it is in this context we have uh, seen the internet uh, shutdown First of all, it was for us, I, I combined this two questions already. It was uh, something very particular and uh, emotional also because we have received many debates coming from civil society, NGO in the country, and also international NGO who are here in, in the country. And uh, we decide to look careful and see how it can be useful for us as a case. And I think we have worked closely with our regional office in Dhaka, where the idea arrived that how can us use this like uh, a strategic litigation a case and see how it can help other countries in the region, West Africa. And then it become for us clear that ECOWAS court can be a way for us to have this kind of decision or judgment which can be like a lesson for other countries in the, in the region. I think if it is in Togo, we can, we are, we can, I can tell you that we can have a chance to have a good judgment. No, because we know our system here, how it works. 
very slowly and with no will also for, for from the authorities to do something around this kind of uh, situation. And it can't be their priorities at this moment. Then we have decided to go to ECOWAS court because also in the past we have received another good decision, not on uh, internet, but like uh, on uh, torture, for example. Then we have decided to go there where we can have uh, this kind of uh, judgments. It's what I can put on the table. Yeah. Great, thank you so much. Uh, and you know, and I, this makes me wish, you know, we as in, in East Africa had a, you know, stronger court like you, because um, the ECOWAS courts are indeed setting such an interesting and important precedent here. Um, so moving from Togo swiftly to Indonesia, Ade, uh, same question for you. You know, why did the Indonesian government shut down the internet in Papua and why did you take them to court? Okay, uh, thank you again. Yeah, uh, uh, as uh, the public now is Papua is, uh, the area is uh, still uh, many conflict. And at the time in last year, 2019, uh, in August, there is a mass uh, conflict in the Papua. Uh, then uh, the government is like, they use a shortcut because they see the many of the hawks spreading in the uh, Papua and they cut the internet. Uh, the internet shutdown is first time for Indonesia, but the throttling or slowdown is already three times. And uh, internet shutdown in the region was done because uh, it was surprised the dissemination of the hawks information that was considered to provoke the community. But uh, in other hand, when the internet uh, disconnect, there were sectors that were affected, such as uh, education, uh, e-government, and uh, journalism also. Uh, so that we represent a civil society uh, feeling citizen lawsuit with the organizational legal standing mechanism. Uh, uh, the before we feeling the lawsuit, we usually we make like a theory of case, uh, which uh, case uh, we will uh, feeling the to the court, and we choose the press freedom is more natural. Uh, we can choose the e-government, we can choose a freedom of expression or a business sector, but uh, in this time, uh, press freedom in Indonesia is more natural and uh, more strong legal basis uh, to bring to the court. Uh, why and uh, many argument in our lawsuit is all about the human rights and about the how uh, press freedom uh, using in the conflict area. And uh, and the main argument is the loss of the internet to uh, hinders to work journalists to provide information to the public. Like that. And uh, uh, the key argument of the lawsuit is uh, some of the call felt by journalists and the media such inability to disseminate information in online media, difficulty communicating with the resource persons, difficulty of the fact checking. Uh, the television, yeah, they can live broadcast and there is uh, no print media. Also, all activities in journalistic were affected to the, uh, because the internet shut down. And also, the, um, the important thing is, is like uh, collaboration. In this uh, lawsuits, we not only LBFS is not only a plaintiff, but we are a legal, we are lawyers. We have a collaboration with other organizations. Uh, we separate three teams. It's like the first is principal teams. Principal team is as the plaintiff of the organization. It's like the uh, journalist alliance. Mm -hmm. And the second team is litigation team. Litigation teams are lawyer who makes and prepare legal argument in the court is like our organizations. And the third is about the campaign team. This collaboration team is very important in the uh, strategic litigations. Uh, also, the, the most challenge is 
so many uh, attack coming to us because uh, they are the buzzer is like to press them. Uh, we are supporting of Papua independence is yeah like because it's very sensitive issue yeah, about the uh, independence in some area in the province like that and uh, they using this issue to yeah to decrease our uh, our uh, to the public something like that mm. yeah okay um thank you so much Ade. and that's the you know you raise a really important point here is that you know it's 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 not always you know uh, rosy and nice and green to see your government it also comes with a lot of challenge and you also raise an important point here that you know it's not just about um you know filing a, a, a petition at the court but it's also about advocacy and you know raising public awareness so you raise some really interesting points and we'll come back to that uh later on um so i want to move on to uh to saba um from uh, from media defense um, so your organization litigates on public interest issues specifically related to freedom of expression and press freedom and other issues and you've set some really interesting precedents previously within the ECOWAS courts, but then now, uh, so my question for you here today is, you know, is this your first litigation on shutdowns and why now and why the shutdown specifically in Togo? Thanks, um, Bahan. Yeah, um, so I guess it's probably just building on what um, Amy was saying about Togo and what the reason was why we as lawyers decided that this was going to be a, a good opportunity for us to get involved in the litigation. So obviously um, the shutdown happened in 2017. So whilst we are seeing a trend at the moment with, with shutdowns, this, this happened a good few years ago. And at that point, there wasn't much litigation that was going on through either domestic or kind of international mechanisms that were looking at these issues so when this came about it was a, a good opportunity to get involved in litigation the other kind of consideration for us was the fact that the ECOWAS court was an available regional mechanism and actually the court doesn't require you to access that court you don't actually need to have exhausted domestic remedies so that was something that we had um, found difficult for example in other jurisdictions whereby litigation through the domestic courts had been stored but we had no access to a regional mechanism to to kind of take the case to but the equus court doesn't actually have that requirement so again that was something to you know when you're considering litigation you're kind of it's it's an accessible court um that you can go to um and then similarly to what um amy was saying in terms of setting a precedent um for the region was something that was going to be considered and in um you know a, a positive judgment which we think we've got now from from the ECOWAS court is inevitably going to set a precedent um for the region and and you can use that more globally as well um i guess just one other thing also when as lawyers when you're looking to litigate cases is identifying appropriate petitioners or applicants and often you know um with internet shutdowns, I guess one of the considerations is that these are coming, are being held in, in jurisdictions where um, there's often, you know, quite an authoritarian state and you need to weigh up um, whether you're going to get applicants and petitioners coming forward and what the risk value is of those kind of applicants in coming forward to litigate these cases. So. For us, I mean, um, Media Defence is quite a small organisation. We're based in London. Um, we were able to work with Amnesty International, Amnesty Togo, um, who have far, you know, better resources than us in in kind of collating evidence, whether that's witness statements, etc. And we had applicants that were willing to kind of go forward um, to to kind of bring the claim. So for us, um, Togo was all of these kind of things were were plus points and, and going to the Equus court um i mean it took some time the case the shutdown happened in 2017 and i think we filed at the end of 2018 after we had kind of um collated the necessary evidence and managed to get what we needed to put in a strong application and then obviously the judgment has come out um a few weeks ago so these things always take time and um it's it's useful to have like to partner up with organizations that may have better reach contacts 
domestically in the region um, to be able to put forward a, a, a strong a strong application to the court. Um, thank you, Sava, for that. Um, and I, I will definitely come back to some of the work that Media Defense is, is particularly doing on, on shutdowns later on. So, Natalia, um, I'm, I'm coming to you here. I, I, I know Access Now has intervened in both in the Togo and Indonesia case. Uh, and I want you to tell us how, I want you to tell, us, tell the public how we intervene, intervened and specifically on, on what that intervention was. And I know specifically intervening in the Togo case was not easy. There was, you know, the government had challenged our standing with the court and, you know, had challenged um, the, the amicus brief that we had submitted. Um, so I, I think that's also an interesting uh, story to tell in terms of being prepared. Um, so tell us, you know, what happened, what transpired and why we intervened in these cases as well. Thank you, Barhan. Yes, so as you mentioned in both cases, in the ECOWAS court uh, in Togo and Indonesia Jakarta court, we intervened uh, as friends of the court or amici curé uh, with a brief uh, advising the court uh, on international legal standards that and norms that, that are applicable to internet shutdowns. Um, in particular, we also uh, shared our expertise of the Keep It On Coalition, explaining the court, what are shutdowns, why they're important, uh, and encourage uh, the court not to look not only uh, at internet shutdowns in the context of the right of freedom of expression, which is of course important, but it's sort of the most uh, widely applied uh, um, right to this uh, event, but there's also other rights that might be violated, such as the rights of freedom of assembly, uh, right to work, health, education, and cultural rights. Um, so we did that uh, in the Indonesia case, we did our own brief, and then in the ECOWAS case, we joined with eight, uh, it was a coalition of eight organizations that we led. And uh, amicus briefs are uh, have become a standard practice in many courts around the world. Uh, including the Jakarta court and the ECOWAS court. Uh, so we have seen such interventions in the past and they haven't really been challenged before. Uh, but in the Togo case, the Togolese government decided to challenge our submission and uh, they made a number of arguments which frankly kind of just showed that they didn't have proper understanding of the role of amici and also of the rules of the court. Uh, so they made this argument that we cannot uh, make a submission because we are experts and so there are different rules that apply to experts. Um, they also uh, cited other rules, uh, Article 43 of the, of the uh, ECOWAS rules and the ECOWAS protocol, various, um, you know, cited various um, rules to say that basically our submission was improper and that we were not specifically ordered by the court or by one of the parties. But we did, I mean, it was a, a bit unexpected to, to be honest, but at the same time, we were uh, quick in coming up with there's a lot of case law on this from ECOWAS, but also other courts in West Africa. Um, and there are also rules and protocols of the court itself that po point us to actually the, the right decision in this case. And so we cited all of that and the court actually ruled in our favor, uh, saying that they distinguish between third party interventions, uh, which are for parties that are sort of directly affected by the outcome of the case and amici who are just uh, there to be friends of the court and advise the court on the international standards. Uh, and so the court has that power and discretion to allow for uh, amici to intervene. Um, and so this was a very good decision and we hope that it would become precedent also for other cases where NGOs and other actors are uh, trying to intervene uh, on shutdown cases and beyond. Uh, because we think it's important to share our expertise with the court and make sure that the court has a full understanding of not only the significance of shutdowns for human rights, but also that uh, the courts would apply international human rights standards to such cases to the fullest extent. So we were happy that the, the, court, uh, the court decision in this case. Um, thank you so much, Natalia, for that. And I think um, that that specific precedent that, you know, not just on the shutdown, but on being able to be friends of the court is really important and, you know, gives 
and not just international organizations like us. And I think that Amicus was not just us, it was you know, a coalition of other grassroots civil society groups uh, from Africa and other places as well. So that gives us a lot of um, energy to continue. Um, so I'm, I'm coming to you, Peter. Uh, Access Now has been documenting internet shutdowns as early as 2011. I think the first few cases that I can even remember from that you have talked about is the, the Wi-Fi outage in San Francisco uh, transportation system. Um, you know, so much has changed since uh, since then, and you know, we're documenting way more shutdowns than before. Um, so what do you think is the role of the newly formed legal arm within Access Now? Uh, and how will that be defining, how will shutdowns and our work will be defining the lit litigation against shutdowns, but then also some of the work that Access Now wants to do on this topic? Thank you. Uh, that shutdown in San Francisco in 2011 was shocking. Um, up till that point, the only shutdowns we'd seen were uh, maybe in Egypt or Myanmar. Shutdowns were seen as the tool of dictators, um, not something that any you know, supposedly democratic uh, government would allow or uh, that officials certainly in, in the heart of Silicon Valley would uh, put in place. Um, the, uh, the responses to that, that San Francisco shutdown, as well as to the Egypt shutdown, um, did find their way into, into court and regulatory bodies. Um, in Egypt, it, there was reporting that um, after the Mubarak regime famously shut down the internet, uh, at the height of protests in early 2011, um, the telcos took the regime to court and actually won a large award for their lost profits. Um, there was no uh, follow up on that and it doesn't seem like the telcos shared that award with, you know, the people uh, who actually had their rights directly violated and, um, and lost access at that crucial moment. And I'm happy to say that, you know, the public interest has been uh, and continues to be represented in all of these cases that we've heard. Um, we were happy to get involved uh, with media uh, defense in the Cameroon cases, um, working closely with um, lawyers on the ground there. And, and as we've heard in the following uh, cases in ECOWAS. And I think uh, the, these cases are growing in prominence and uh, the, uh, the coalition is maturing in our strategy. Uh, we heard just earlier this morning at RightsCon that uh, litigation cannot occur in a vacuum, it can't occur in isolation, that it really needs to be um, one sharp tool uh, among many. And, uh, you know, it's the tip of the spear and the spear, you know, is really in the hands of the coalition, it's uh, in the hands of the movement. Uh, who are making the uh, making uh, the case that shutdowns not only violate uh, human rights like uh, that to assembly and uh, access to information and expression, but actually uh, damage entire societies in terms of their uh, e economies, their digital economies, and their access to health and education information online. And uh, that's what this broad-based movement, uh, the Keep It On, is uh, it has become. The legal arm, we want to uh, leverage this, this great, broad, robust coalition, all the evidence that this coalition is able to collect um, on these different impacts, uh, you know, the human, the economic, the social, um, leverage those impacts and tell the story in court in a way that uh, you know, these, these fairly usually senior judges uh, who don't have a lot of experience with the internet can understand and, and can understand in a way that they can adjudicate, right? That they can see that not only these are rights and interests that are being uh, directly harmed by the, the government's action, but there's, there's a role for the courts to play. And um, our, our legal arm, which I'm, I'm happy to say has grown and has matured uh, to include uh, Natalia and others, um, is, is looking to uh, play sort of a, a central nervous system role. We want to coordinate, we want to uh, strengthen, you know, send resources out to uh, those really intrepid, often solo practitioners, those small legal offices or NGOs, um, like we've seen in, in Indonesia and Cameroon and elsewhere, who do face reprisal for bringing these cases. We want to reinforce them um, with the, the uh, legitimacy, with the expertise, with the gravitas 
of an international coalition um, where that's where that's going to be helpful and uh, called for and requested. And um, so that's that role we want to play is uh, helping to you know uh, spread communication to ensure that we build on the precedents um, that we've seen uh, in these really great victories recently in Indonesia and the ECOWAS. Um, so we, yeah, well, we want to keep this vantage point and then keep uh, punching upwards and looking towards those international institutions, um, uh, towards those international courts and regional courts that, uh, you know, will, we hope eventually um, speak directly to this and uh, you know, build on again and draw from these uh, individual cases that are so important in ending shutdowns at the national and local levels. Great. Um, thank you so much, Peter. And um, I think you raised one really important thing here. You know, um, the the solo lawyers that are frustrated with with you know having to experience shutdown every other week, not really understanding how they can you know engage, is is is, is very important to, for you know for Access Now and for the legal team and media defense and others to be able to channel that resources and that you know, whether it's the briefs or the petitions, you know, um, that's that's I think is a really um, is a really good and important place to start. And I think the second thing that you mentioned as well here is the senior judges don't necessarily understand how the internet works, you know, how uh, much of these courts that we engage with are rarely online, right? Um, so uh, it's so it's important that, you know, we meet them where they are as well. So those two are, are important things. Um, um, so I want to encourage the audience to ask questions. We have a few questions uh, in the chat, but as you, you know, as the conversation goes on, please uh, do uh, add your questions. So we have a comment uh, from the chat that says, you know, no requirement for exhaustion of local remedies, uh, unique features at the ECOWAS court. Indeed, um, as Saba said, those are very, very unique um, features of the ECOWAS court. And I wish, I know many, uh, many of my brothers and sisters across the continent wish that they had <laughs> this sort of court. Um, and we, we have a case in, in Uganda that's still stuck, but it has to, for instance, we have to exhaust that, that, that local mechanism before we move to the East African courts. Uh, and, and other similar situations as well. Uh, so if that was the case, we would have moved um, to the East African courts um, in, in Arusha. Um, so there's a question here for uh, for Amy from, from Togo, uh, but uh, I know this is an open, uh, and I wanna open this up to, to the other participants as well because it, it affects others as well. So uh, Jean-Paul, uh, our friend Jean-Paul asked, um, you know, have you faced any threats during the litigation process? So Amy for you, and then after he's done, uh, Ade, you can continue. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, before I jump to the question, uh, can I add something about ECOWAS particularity? Uh, I think we are afraid. We we are afraid that uh, in the next future, I think some countries will uh, go to amend the protocol to see if they can go in the, in a system where you need to finish with local system before joining the ECOWAS court. We are afraid, but at this moment, we are happy that we can go without any system at local level. Then uh, it is what we have like as a challenge for the future. We can use uh, our network for advocacy when we, we, we will have these issues. I hope and trust that you will join us if there is a campaign on, on, on that. Uh, for for from Jean Paul, I think I can tell you honestly, we haven't received any physical treat or a particular treat during this uh, process. Uh, but we have a huge challenge with uh, the administration in in the country, because before send the document to the court, you need to have the what you call here legalization legalization. You need to have the stamp of the administration of a notary service that the, it is a, the authentic document. I can tell you that in the, all the world Togo, no notary has accepted to put his signature and the stamp on our document. They have refused. When they see that there is something against the country or against the authorities, they say, okay, okay no, no, I can't do it. Go. Yeah, when you go there, other, another people will say go in another place. Then it was a very difficult moment, but we have tried with our own relation to find some people who have accepted to put their stamp and signature to send it. But now we are afraid for a long term, a long term treat. 
particular with our local partners because it's not just Amnesty International Togo, but you have other NGO, which they are very local, very small NGO. And we have also a, a journalist, a freelancer. She has accepted to join the, the, the case. And then I think we know how the, our regime works. Perhaps they could use other, other, other uh, ways to, to stop funding or something uh, for this local NGO. We are here looking and working closely with them to see how we can uh, together go over this kind of uh, treat we can have uh, in the future. But uh, clearly, yeah, uh, human rights work, you need to consider treat when you, you want to do something against authorities or something like that. That we have, uh, um, uh, we have planned something uh, for this next year, uh, for the next year, to see how we can follow the decision and how we can continue working together. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amy. You've spoken like a true, uh, true warrior there, a peaceful one though. Um, so uh, over to you, Adi. Yeah. Uh, in the first time. I believe that the litigation is the safe way because it is, uh, yeah, it's the legal way to against the government what they are doing. Uh, but yeah, in the in the in the process, so many challenges. Uh, uh, what we uh, have is like the first is about the plaintiff legal standing. Uh, the organization who be plaintiff is in Jakarta, but the case in the Papua is. So many uh, defendant argue that they not be able to do uh, feeling lawsuit because we we are in the Jakarta. It's like that. And the second is uh, about the yeah we uh, they they call we are supporting the Papua independence. It's it's very very sensitive issue that uh, what I said before uh, when when the people. Uh, look, we are the supporting the Papua independence. Yeah, the public support is, will decrease for for us. It's very very dangerous also for the uh, future of the uh, lawsuit because sometimes the uh, judge is looking in the political context. Uh, and the third is uh, the government in the context of the internet shutdown, usually using the state in the state of danger is like. Yeah, emergency action. Yeah, uh, then uh, we also using this argument in the court. The if you if the government want to using the emergency action is like there is specific uh, to fulfill is like the human rights standard something like that. And and yeah, we we won and the judge is uh, agree with us uh, about the. Uh, how the government using the emergency action, yeah, and in the uh, in the case is like uh, the judge ruled that it was considered an emergency that the president should have used the decision, not the press release from the ministry only like that, yeah. Okay. Um. Thank you so much, Ali. That's that's you two raise a really important point here. It's not just you know. The, your physical safety it's also you know smear campaigns from governments and you know trying to uh, dissuade the public from uh, from supporting your really important work so this is definitely an uphill um, battle that changed from one country to another um so i, I want to go back to and again i want to encourage uh, the audience if you if you have any questions please pop them in the chat um so i i want to go back to saba from media defense um so this was indeed a, a good win um, for you know, uh, uh, for our fight for against internet shutdowns. So what's next? What does this mean uh, for media defense? Because you guys, you know, your your sole mandate and your whole existence is about uh, you know suing governments, which is which is quite admirable. So tell us what's next. What's coming up next for you? Sure. Um, yeah. So obviously we we welcome the Equus decision and the fact that the court took so much time to decide on these issues. Um, that was in a case that I guess was quite evidentially complex for us is 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 used, 
helpful because you're able to use this precedent um, for, for future litigation. So as a group of lawyers, for us always next is what's the next case, what's the next state um, that we can kind of um, launch litigation in. And I mean, I'm, I'm conscious we had cases in the pipeline and I can't really prejudice those cases by naming them, but we have various kind of, we see that the issue of internet shutdowns is one that's not going away. So we are seeing this um, happen in various jurisdictions and ways of now, now that we have this judgment coming out of like a regional mechanism to use that along with the domestic kind of um, decisions that have come out of Indonesia, um, Kashmir, et cetera, um, is, is all, all gonna form part of like the next strategic litigation of for internet shutdowns. The other thing I guess just to kind of know um, about what's next often with cases and um, when judgment comes out, there's this kind of, um, whilst you get these positive decisions and it's great, often there's the kind of afterthought of implementation. And we've heard um, a lot of the times from you know participants um, on this call as well that litigation doesn't normally have, you know, it's, it's, it can't happen in a vacuum. And once you get these decisions, what would you do or how would you go about trying to get them to be implemented? Um, and that can be, that sometimes that can be quite difficult um, in terms of how you make sure that the decisions that the courts have been made are actually being impacted within the region or the country that um, that, you know, that the order has been made. And I guess um, often advocacy campaigns are some something that, you know, does kick in at this point and um, to highlight that actually the state that's in question hasn't done it, any of the steps that has been that has been needed to be done within the order. Um, so whether that's like repealing um, laws or, or putting new laws in place that adhere to national or international standards or even payment, um, if there are damages, awards or, or costs that are being um, ordered by a court, often you know that takes time um, for applicants to get payment. So all of these things are considerations. So just because judgments come out, it's often that's not the final step, it's implementation. And as far as media defense is concerned, yeah, we, we're going to continue litigating and we've been learning so much through these litigations that we've been doing through, um, you know, Togo. And then I think Peter mentioned Cameroon, etc. So all of this for us are you know, um, as lawyers learning curves and we're able to implement that into the next kind of case um, that we're going to be litigating, yeah. Great, um, thank you very much uh, for that, Saba. Um, so I want to I wanna go back to, um, you know, our, our, our forefront fighters, so those folks that are on the ground that are actually experiencing the shutdown and, you know, taking uh, taking government's course. So uh, back to you, Ade and, and, and Amy. Um, are there any lessons that you've learned uh, from from this specific litigation? You know, uh, for others that are on the call that are listening and are interested to bring um, cases against uh, against their um, their respective governments, you know, what would you advise them? What would you do differently? And that's a, this is a question that came uh, from the audience as well. So maybe we can start with Adi, and then we can go to Amy. Yeah. In yeah, in our experience, there is no. Uh, what uh, not to do is is like we need to consistent with the our strategy. Uh, the minimum theme is like litigation and non litigation, and you can choose where you stay. You can choose litigation, and you will focus to yeah uh, in the litigation. And if you choose non litigation, you can choose a campaign something like that. I think. The consistency of the uh, where you stay is, I think, is important because it's like in the collaboration team. Yeah, you cannot do this uh, alone, or you can do the lawsuit is with together uh, because it's you fight you against the government. You you're not against the individual or the business like, that, but you against the government. The government is not only one; is the yeah, so many inside them. Okay. Great, thank you. Um, Amy? Uh, okay. Uh, for us, I think what we have learned during this process is uh, how to work together uh, to make sure that uh, we are 
in the same line and how we choose the case, the situation. And uh, I think it is something you can see every day in Togo, to see many NGOs working together uh, to start and finish without any struggle or many problems with voices, and I think. Then also we need to see our power and capacities before going to the litigation. Yeah, because for me, I can say that without uh, the expertise from our headquarters in London or without uh, access now, contribution, media, legal defense and other NGO, it will be very difficult for us uh, to go. Then we need to see what we have at legal, uh, at local uh, stage and also what we can assert from the outside to bring it together and make sure that we can go and have something which can be very useful. I think it is something I have learned and uh, yeah, for the future, I think uh, what we can do better is to coordinate more and have more proof. I think there is a gap on that way. Yeah, I think we need to see technical practice to see how we can be very proactive when we see a shutdown uh, in, in the country. I think there is, it is a challenge and I hope we can have these capacities. And if people or somebody have this capacity, help us, uh, train us, and uh, then we can ourselves be in the position to have some element, technical element to, to show yeah, the internet shutdown. Um, great. Uh, thank you for that. And you raised a really uh, interesting point there, like, let, you know, knowing your capacity and the, we can't just do this by ourselves. It has to be, you know, in collaboration with others, with expertise and the challenges are also really salient here. Um, so we have another question from the audience and I'll read out the question and, you know, uh, folks feel free to volunteer to answer. In the litigations carried out so far and that are also ongoing, what legal principles can one de derive that are applicable to shutdowns? Um, my sick. Go. Thanks. Um, this is a great question. Um, we are trying to, first of all, you know, analyze all of the judgments that are issued on internet shutdowns. We've got a database tracking all the cases that we know of um, that are brought uh, against governments as well as against telcos for, for shutting down, for throttling um, and denying service. And so, first of all, like if you hear of those cases, um, please do get in touch with us um, at Access Now and keep it on. Um, a few principles that we've seen effective. Um, first is, is the principle of proportionality. Uh, any interference with the rights of freedom of expression and access to information uh, must be necessary and also proportionate. And uh, one thing that I think we've been able to stress about internet shutdowns is that they are disproportionate um, almost as a rule. And I think that is uh, easy, fairly simple for courts to grasp. Uh, another uh, principle to look into is, is the fact that uh, not only the substance matters, the substance of our rights and how they're, um, how they're interfered with and restricted unlawfully, but also the process. And we've seen a few rulings that um, sort of put aside the substantive constitutional or, or human rights at issue and uh, say that the process was, the correct legal process wasn't followed, the government erred, um, and uh, therefore this, their action was, was null and void and not supported um, and not legal. Um, and, uh, you know, those rulings aren't um, necessarily, you know, the, the full some judgment that we want, but they do help end shutdowns quickly. Um, and I'd say, yeah, a final um, a principle uh, that we can look to that, that's coming out of these cases along with proportionality uh, and process is that national security arguments um, will be raised and they are formidable, but they are not um, they are not undefeatable. They, they can be overcome. And that's you know, one thing we saw in this ECOWAS ruling um, on Togo is that even though Togo raised national security arguments saying that this interference was necessary, um, that the court was able to see beyond those and, and overcome that defense. Um, thank you, Peter, for that. Um, Saba or Natalia, if you want to come, if you want, if you have anything to add on onto this question, I let me I invite you to do that. If not, then I can move on to the next question. 
okay, silence is consensus. Um, so Natalia, can you, um, can you, because my understanding is that, you know, this, this ruling, as much as, you know, they're in our favor, um, and as much as, you know, as we like them, and we're very happy that the way that they came out, is that they don't necessarily outright ban uh, you know, internet shutdowns. For instance, the ruling in Togo doesn't say the government should never, ever, ever, you know, shut down the internet ever again. That's not the case. So can you tell us, you know, what the shortcomings are and how we need to push a bit further? Or are we satisfied with what we have now? Thank you, Mirhan. Yes, so in the ECOWAS case, uh, the court uh, overall ruled in consistence with uh, what we expected and talked a lot about with about the right to freedom of expression and how shutdowns violate that. So the court said that actually access to internet is included within this right to freedom of expression and that uh, this right requires protection of the law. Um, and then it, it did rule that uh, the actions of the government of Togo violated this right because it was not based in any legitimate purpose and it was not based in law. Uh, however, uh, the court sort of didn't go beyond those parameters of the right to freedom of expression in its discussion, uh, which we actually encouraged the court to do in our submission where we wanted to, the court to also consider other rights, such as the right to freedom of assembly, but also the uh, social and economic rights, such as the right to work, education, health, and um, others. And um, so this was something that we would uh, like to see other courts do to look at these other rights, because as Peter said, that internet is just so essential for our whole life and um, we cannot ignore that significance. Another thing that sort of the court, as also Patrick mentioned in a previous session, is that the court within the within the parameter of the freedom of expression, the court also didn't go beyond the first prong, which is whether the shutdowns are based in law. And as Peter just said, just mentioned that there's several. So there's uh, it has to be based in law. It has to be necessary and it has to be proportionate. So the court didn't really look at those other two uh, prongs. Uh, however, it did say that um, that you know the shutdowns were unlawful, even just because of the you know just because of the first prong, and that the government should not do that in the future, and that uh, it, uh, the government has obligations to then enact laws that would be consistent with this right, and that would ensure protection to to the um, Togolese citizens. Uh, in contrast, in Indonesia case, uh, we saw that the courts actually looked at the proportionality principle. Um, it, it used its own sort of three-part test where they looked at um, whether sort of the, the, the actions of the government were based on like observing public order, religious moral values, and the court in that case said, yes, it was. Um, but the other two prongs which the court used is they said it was not based in law. There was no existing law that allowed specifically shutdowns of the whole network versus just blocking of specific content. And also the court mentioned that it was not proportional. And so in this case, it's sort of the, this court it went beyond uh, sort of this just one uh, lawfulness prong, but uh, it did not look at the necessity. And another thing is that um, that also I think uh, SafeNet and ELSAM, uh, the parties to the case, they they previously told us is that they they kind of have a sense that it might not be the court decision doesn't really go as much as the ECOWAS court decision. It doesn't really say that okay the government should not do this anymore and it should en enact certain laws. So there is a sort of concern whether it will happen again and they might go and challenge it again. So this is something where we think it, it doesn't go as far, but we nevertheless are still very happy that uh, we have these positive decisions and that we think that they still uh, provide useful precedents for other courts and jurisdictions. Thank you. Um, great, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Natalia. And we have a few minutes left, so I, I wanna go back to Ade and Ami. Uh, Ami, I wanna ask, you know, what's next for you as, as, as organization. So let's start with Ade and then we can close off yeah. uh, with, with Amy. So Ade, please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, uh, now we still have the article of the blocking. 
the uh, government use for the internet shutdown. And our plan, uh, yeah, hope in the next month we will uh, go to the uh, constitutional court to uh, to filling the lawsuit uh, this article because in 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 our country is like uh, government said this hoax and the government also detected the, the <laughs> content yeah uh, everything uh, from the government there is no judicial process and that's why uh, i think it's uh, very important for us to uh, against the yeah, the potential uh, yeah, potential dictator like like that i think Okay, uh, up to you, Amy. Yeah, okay. Uh, I think for us, uh, for the next step, we will uh, see how we will have a plan for the implementation of the decision, the court decision, because you have uh, two or three points in the decision where you, the government need to do new law, for example. Then we need to wake up and make sure that it will be a bad law because the, the authorities can use the the opportunities to do something against yeah. uh, freedom of expression or to say something on uh, national security because you have uh, in the north of the country some situation with Burkina Faso and Mali then uh, we hope that it will go it will go in, the, in this way uh, it is what we have uh, and also about security issues for the plaintiff in the country with local NGO and our colleagues, uh, Fadi, uh, the journalist, freelancer. I think it is what we have, like uh, something a plan for next year or quickly uh, in the future. Thank you. Great. Um, thank you so much, uh, everybody, for joining us. I want to thank my, thank my colleagues, Emmy Ade, Saba, Natalia, and Peter, for joining me today. It was a really lovely conversation. Keep on fighting the good fight. Uh, if you are listening and if you're a civil society organization, we, we, we have a coalition called Keep It On uh, that, you know, um, coordinates and, and, and investigates and, you know, coordinates much of the, the work that we do around internet shutdown. So please feel free to join us uh, and my colleagues will put in the, the necessary link for you to be able to access that as well. So thank you so much again and have a pleasant uh, RightsCon. Bye all. Bye.